let's restart the meeting. It's uh, 1 10 right now. And I'll just take it upon myself to do a, a quick roll call. Um, Mr. Sweet has excused himself until uh, about 2 2 30. Um, board member Sweet. So, um, uh, Dr. Paris, myself present. Uh, Dr. Daniels? Daniels? Present. Uh, Ms. Jeanette Cruz? Present. And Dr. Adams? Present. Okay, thank you. We have a quorum. I'll turn it back over to you, Judge Wong. All right, thank you, Dr. Paris. And uh, just to confirm, Ms. Hendrickson, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, and Mr. Hill, and is um, Mr. Hill with you? Yes. Okay, great. So you can hear me out as well. All right. So, Madam Court Reporter, if we could go ahead and go back on the record. Uh, so we're on the record before the excuse me, Board of Chiropractic Examiners, Department of Consumer Affairs, State of California, in the matter of the petition for reinstatement of surrendered license by Brent Anthony Hill. It is agency case number AC2013-974 and OAH number 2022-090782. My name is Corin Wong. I am an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I have been signed, assigned to preside over this matter. Uh, to establish a quorum of the board for the record, I request that each member respond audibly after his or her name is called. Uh, Dr. Paris? Present. Uh, Dr. Adams? Present. Mr. Sweet? Ms. Cruz? Present. Dr. Daniels. Daniels. Present. Let the record reflect that a quorum is uh, present. And next, may I take the appearance of counsel starting with uh, the Deputy Attorney General? Uh, thank you, uh, Your Honor. Uh, this is Deputy Attorney General Jeff Stone appearing for the Office of the Attorney General on behalf of the people of the state of California pursuant to Government Code Section 11522. Good afternoon, sir. And um, Ms. Hendrickson. Good afternoon. Nicole Hendrickson on behalf of petitioner Brent Hill. Good afternoon. Uh, Ms. Hendrickson, were you um, present earlier when I talked about the procedural uh, format of the hearings? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And do you have any questions? No. Okay. If you have any questions uh, at any time, please do not hesitate to ask. Um, so, Mr. Stone, if you would um, like to provide your documents or a summary overview, whichever you prefer to do first. Sure. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, regarding the documents in the case, um, I would uh, refer the court uh, to and the board to the uh, copy of the notice of the hearing and the declaration of service, <clears throat> excuse me, for jurisdictional purposes. And then uh, we have the Petitioner's application for reinstatement of surrendered license and the attachments, uh, they are at uh, Bates label BCE1 through BCE61. And then we have certified copies of the uh, petitioner's prior disciplinary uh, proceedings on file with the board, and those are at uh, BCE62 through uh, 103. And uh, we also have the uh, continuing education log uh, prepared by the board staff regarding the uh, petitioner's uh, continuing education. All right, thank you. So let's go ahead and mark uh, mark the request to set as Exhibit One, and Exhibit Two will include the October thirteenth, two thousand twenty-two memorandum to the board, continuing education log, and petition for reinstatement of revoked license and supporting documents. Exhibit 3 will consist of the decision and order, stipulated surrender of license and order, second amended accusation, first amended accusation, and accusation. And 4 will consist of the notice of hearing and memorandum to Mr. Stone. Um, first, Ms. Uh, Ms. Hendrickson, any objection to Exhibit 1 and or 4 for jurisdictional purposes only? No. All right, those exhibits will be so admitted. And then Ms. Hendrickson, any objection to exhibit two and or three for all purposes? 
Um, the only objection I have is to exhibit three because it includes the first amendment accusation and the first accusation, which were superseded by the second amended accusa accusation. So I didn't see the purpose of those two documents. All right. So um, the objections or I guess, Mr. Stone, your response to the objection. Well, uh, those are uh, the pleadings of the board certified copies of the pleadings. Um, it, it is true that the final, the final pleading is the operative pleading. Uh, so, however, the court and the board would like to proceed. Uh, they're all, you know, subject to to the, the foundation has, has been laid to them all. They are certified uh, copies, uh, but the only operative pleading is the second amendment complaint. All right, Ms. Hendrickson, anything for accusation? Oh, sorry, uh, Ms. Hendrickson, anything further you wanted to argue? No, I agree with everything you said. Okay, so the objections overruled. Um, and uh, three will be admitted for all purposes. All right, with that, Mr. Stone, if you'd like to provide your summary. Uh, thank you. Uh, the petitioner uh, was uh, issued um, uh, license number DC 18107 uh, on or about January 7th of 1987. The license uh, was surrendered to the board effective April 9th, 2016. Um, the uh, Discipline that was effective uh, April 9th of 2016 was in relation to a decision and order in case number AC 2013 974. Um, that was based on uh, charges that are contained in the second amendment accusation um, filed on October 26, 2015. Um, there are approximately 15 uh, causes for discipline uh, within that. Um, ranging from uh, conduct exceeding the scope of practice, uh, conduct outside the scope of practice, conduct likely to uh, endanger health, safety, and welfare of the public, gross negligence, unprofessional conduct, um, excessive treatment, uh, failure to refer to a uh, physician, and dispensing uh, and, administering, and administering controlled uh, substances. Generally speaking, uh, there was a diet program that was offered by petitioner, and that diet program uh, consisted of uh, injections uh, that included substances, controlled substances such as uh, testosterone um, in relation to um, uh, a number of uh, patients. Uh, in addition to the uh, stipulated surrender, uh, there was cost recovery that was ordered um, of $44,000, uh, $44,177.68. Uh, and those uh, costs have been paid uh, to the board in full uh, uh, on or about September 16th of uh, 2022. Uh, there have not been any uh, previous petitions or a reinstatement and uh, regarding continuing education pursuant to CCR Title 16, Section 365, a uh, petitioner has provided uh, evidence regarding that uh, continuing education consisting of 144 hours uh, um, with uh, 12 hours of ethics and law and 24 hours of mandatory uh, subject areas. Uh, in relation to petitioners, uh, petition. Uh, there are uh, letters that have been submitted in support of uh, petitioner, uh, approximately eight letters that can be reviewed at uh, Bates Label DCE 052 through 060. These letters in support are from two colleagues, a former employee, former patient, and four church uh, colleagues. And uh, with that summary, um, I uh, uh, pass the case uh, off. For further handling. All right, thank you, Ms. Hendrickson. Do you have any additional docs documents you wanted to submit? No, Your Honor. All right. And did you have any witnesses you wanted to call other than Mr. Hill? No. Okay. And do you wish to provide a opening statement? Yes. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your time. This matter involves a petition for reinstatement of license by Brent Hill, 
who surrendered his license with the board effective April 9, 2016. Disciplinary action against him arose from an accusation which led to two amended accusations involving his conduct while he was a 49% shareholder in a joint chiropractic medical practice called Hill Center for Integrative Medicine. On August 29, 2022, Mr. Hill filed his petition with the board for the following reasons. One, he has spent six years rehabilitating his life, reflecting on what happened, learning from the experiences he went through, and he is ready to show the board the significant changes he has made. Two, the income would significantly help him and his family who are currently on government assisted programs. Three, he loves this career, interacting with people, helping people, and he hopes to have the opportunity to go back to that. And four, he wants to show the board that he is safe to practice as he has spent significant time to grow personally, spiritually, and professionally. There is no doubt that the allegations in the second amended accusation are serious, and he is not here to challenge those allegations against him, but to discuss today what he has learned from all of this and to acknowledge those he has hurt. I know personally that for six years he has reflected on all of this and what has happened, and he has spent six years to not only rebuild his life, but to be here one day in front of you all. Without a doubt, he will tell you what today means to him. And carefully considering the totality of facts and circumstances with safety of the public being paramount, we believe the evidence today will demonstrate that Mr. Hill has demonstrated the requisite rehabilitation to ensure the board that the public is safe. Therefore, after all the evidence is considered, excuse me, Mr. Hill respectfully requests that his license be reinstated with any terms and conditions that the board deem appropriate, including any monitoring that it may uh, decide. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, do you wish to call Mr. Hill at this time? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Hill, um, if I could have you raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will provide in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, you may put your hand down. If I could have you start by stating and spelling your full name for the record, please. My name is Brent Anthony Hill, B-R-E-N-T-A-N-T-H-O-N-Y-H-I-L-L. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hendrickson? Okay, um, I'd like to ask you about the documents that you submitted to the board. So we're going to start um, and look at what is marked BCE uh, 000008. And um, as we go through the documents today, just for the board members and for your honor, I'm going to just refer to BCE and then the page number rather than include all the zeros for um, the rest of this time. So for BCE 8, through 11, this is a copy, a uh, true and correct copy of your, I'm sorry, yes, BCE 11, this is a true and correct copy of your CB that you submitted with your petition, is that correct? Yes. Okay, turning to page one, which is BCE 8, I want to start with your background. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Modesto, California. And when did you know you wanted to be a chiropractor? I first was aware of uh, wanting to be a chiropractor after I graduated from high school and I started in college. And so about, about that time period. And what was going on in your life that you knew you wanted to be a chiropractor? Well, during the summer, I had worked in the canneries, which is pretty popular down there to earn your Keep through college, and um, I heard other people talking about going to the chiropractor to take, take care of their their bodies. Um, and then that winter, I had had a skiing accident, and um, thought, well, you know, I needed to get fixed. And thought about these other people going to the chiropractor. I went, and the chiropractor 
was phenomenal. He helped me to recover, and I felt even better than I had before the skiing accident. And so the chiropractor was kind enough to talk to me a little bit more about it and <clears throat> piqued my interest. And I started to uh, look into chiropractic, toured a couple of schools, and set that as my goal to become a chiropractor. And so, what did you do as far as education to start that journey? I attended Modesto Junior College, uh, UC Berkeley, doing my undergraduate there, and then attended Los Angeles College of Chiropractic. And your CV also mentions that you attended Asian American Acupuncture University. Can you tell us about that? Yes. And currently, while I was attending chiropractic college, I also attended the Asian American Acupuncture University. That was on Saturdays and Sundays. So essentially, I was going to class seven days a week. So wonderful education and completed my internship in Taiwan for Chinese medicine and acupuncture. And when did you become licensed by the California Board of Chiropractic? In 1987. Did you ever obtain an acupuncture license in California? No. Do you have any other licenses in California? No. And are you licensed by any other border agency in any other state? Yes. And where is that? In New York. What license do you have in New York? Chiropractic license. And what is your license status in New York? It's current and clear. Did New York ever contact you about your disciplinary action in California? No. Why did you obtain a license in New York? Uh, years ago, I, for the religion I'm a member of, I did quite a bit of volunteer work back in the New York area, in the Brooklyn, uh, New York area. And so I went ahead and received my New York license so that I could make sure that I had proper coverage for uh, malpractice and make sure that I was uh, up to speed on all the laws in New York State as far as chiropractic. And so if we turn to page BCE 9, which is page 2 of your CV, at the bottom you have listed here your experience as a chiropractor. Where did you begin working after you received your chiropractic license? at the back institute of the chiropractic practice in modesto and how long did you work there for i worked from 1986 to 1989 and how many other chiropractors did you work with during that time there was one associate one other associate as well as the owner of the practice so two other chiropractors you list on here chiropractic manipulative therapy which i'll refer to as cmt Besides CMT, did you utilize any other modalities or treatments at the Back Institute? Yes. And what was that? Uh, physiotherapy, uh, um, ultrasound, different types of electrical stimulation, traction, cervical traction, lumbar traction, hydroculator, the hot packs, ice packs, those types of things. And then in 19 or September of 1989, you opened hill chiropractic correct correct and did you employ other chiropractors there yes uh can you tell us over the period that you open or that you owned hill chiropractic at any one time how many chiropractors did you employ uh, between one and three at any given time and besides cmt which you also list on your cv did you utilize any other modalities or treatments at Hill Chiropractic? Yes. And can you tell us about that? Uh, physiotherapy. And so uh, different types of muscle, electrical stimulation, uh, different forms of traction, diathermy, deep heat, ice packs. And also massage therapy. And did you? If we turn back to page one of your CV, which again is BCE 8, you list quite a few different kinds of certifications here and associations. Can you tell us um, any particular certifications that you received during this time? 
there was there was an additional certification that I received of advanced standing certification as a colonic therapist through the IACT organization. The postgraduate studies, um, different uh, courses that I took, certifications on um, the Medical Reserve Corps for the Stanislaus County as a member of that. Um, also, the McKinsey Institute, the McKinsey Spine Institute work different types of uh, stretching and manipulation. In your letter to the board that you submitted with your petition, you discuss your daughter becoming sick in the early 2000s. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, my daughter was in her teens at the time and my oldest daughter. And she had been having aches and pains in her joints and uh, odd rashes on her body, very sensitive to the sun and was feeling horrible. And we took her to different doctors and found out that she had lupus, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, as well as Sjogren's syndrome. And it was just devastating for my wife and I to find that out, just having our, our daughter suffering with um, such uh, horrible autoimmune disease. And so it just kind of, just like any other parent, we kind of set on a quest to find out how we could help her and uh, looked, looked into all different types of uh, treatments for her. And she responded very well uh, with different practitioners and uh, that we had her go to and we felt that those were things that we would like to be able to offer eventually to our patients too. So is that what led to your interest in integrated medicine? Yes. And how did your interest in integrated medicine lead you to open the Hill Center for Integrated Medicine? Well, by gaining that information, seeing the positive results that my daughter had received and uh, you know, led, led to finding out more you know, the proper ways to go about having this done. So what was the goal? What, what idea did you have as far as what you wanted to open? I wanted to be able to offer services for chiropractic care as well as for these other types of care, which would be under the, the direction of medical care. Okay, and how did you meet Keith Carlson? Keith Carlson is my corporate attorney, uh, the corporate attorney that helped to organize all this. And event the original meeting was through the uh, the California Chiropractic Association because he had had some affiliations with them at the time. And so, how did Keith Carlson play a role with? opening the Hill Center for Integrated Medicine? Uh, Mr. Carlson set out uh, all of the, the framework, the legal structure that we needed to follow. He uh, made sure that we had all the operation agreements, the, the, the manuals, the, uh, the proper uh, employment agreements that, that we needed to have in order to um, have that, that structure in place. Okay. And what kind of services did HCIM offer? HCIM offered chiropractic care, so chiropractic manipulation, physiotherapy, which included different types of electrical stimulation, diathermy, traction, uh, massage therapy, hydrocolonic therapy, as well, and then on the medical side, uh, there was the pill diet, hormone therapy, those, those IV therapies, injection, uh, vitamin injections. Okay, let's talk about each side. 
Um, under the chiropractic, how many chiropractors were there? Uh, from time to time, there were different numbers. There were two to five chiropractors at, at any given time. Okay. And any other employees other than um, chiropractors on the chiropractic side? Yes. Okay. What other uh, employees did you have on the chiropractic side? We had chiropractic assistants that helped uh, administer the physiotherapy uh, that was just mentioned, uh, massage therapists, as well as colonic therapists. Okay. And on the medical side, who worked there? Medical director, who was a medical physician, the medical assistants. There were nurse practitioners, physician assistants, RNs, LVNs, uh, also an administrative uh, director over there to uh, coordinate scheduling and, and those types of things. Okay. And what kind of medical services you mentioned? Um, anything else you mentioned the Hill diet, IV therapy, anything else that we not discussed? Um, the vitamin injections, I guess, would be something that we, we already talked about. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, this is the reporter, sir. Can you please keep your voice up? Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank sorry. you. And then the Hill Center for Integrated Medicine shut down when you surrendered your license in 2016. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And before it closed, let's talk about your role there. Okay. You were 49% shareholder. Is that correct? Correct. Tell us what your schedule was at um, HC. Uh, it was referred to as HCIM. Would that be proper? Yes. Tell us what your schedule was like there are days and hours per week. So the, the my my hours would be from eight in the morning till six o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And that was uh, essentially the same hours as the practice. And what were you performing chiropractic care there? Yes. And what types of uh, care were you providing as far as chiropractic goes? What type of chiropractic? Chiropractic manipulation. Were you doing physiotherapy or any other type of modalities? Um, I was primarily doing chiropractic manipulation. And what percentage of your time were you performing chiropractic care? 75 to 80% of the time. What other duties were you performing there? Administrative duties, uh, coordinating schedules, uh, making sure payroll was taken care of properly, those, those type of administrative functions. And so when you say, okay, payroll, what other administrative functions? Oh, there, there's always... Uh, even the minutia of making sure there's enough toilet paper ordered, paper ordered for the copy machine, maintenance on the copy machine, uh, decisions on business equipment, if it needs to be replaced or up, upgraded at any time. And so there's the, you know, there's a million and one things that are going on administratively in an office at any given time. Okay. And what percentage of your time was administrative? About 20% of the time. Okay. Did you have any oversight of the medical side? No. What other duties were you performing besides, we mentioned about 75 to 80% chiropractic, 20% administrative. Were you doing any other duties at HCIM? Very seldomly would do a history or consultation for uh, a patient over on the medical side. When you say we're doing a history and consult, 
What do you mean by that? Essentially capturing information uh, for the medical physician uh, to review and for his staff to do the examination, evaluation, vitals, uh, lab work, all that type of stuff. So I was just capturing information. And why were you doing these? Um, why would you be performing these for the medical side? It, it would just be done when they were uh, over overwhelmed with with patients or uh, got tied up and weren't able to to do a, a consultation or take a history. Um, were you prescribing medications to patients? No. I don't. I don't have a DEA license and I can't prescribe. And there was no no prescribing done by me. Were you able to direct medical care? No. Are, as you sit here today, do you believe that what you were doing was within your scope of practice? At the time, I, I did believe that taking history and consultation was, but after evaluating everything, I could see how that may be misconstrued. And for that, I, I definitely uh, take full responsibility for. And what do you mean by that? It's never my intent to uh, cause any type of confusion with anybody of what my role would be in the practice. And um, definitely that caused confusion with folks or, or any type of harm. I, I apologize for that. Let's talk about what you've been doing since you surrendered your license. Let's go to the second page of your CV, which is BCE 9. And this is under your professional experience. At the bottom there, you have what you've been doing um, since you surrendered. And can you tell us about um, your role uh, as a hydrocolonic therapist, I suppose. Yes, I was performing uh, colonic therapy on folks that would come in for colonic therapy. How many hours per week do you perform this work? About 10 to 15 hours, depending upon one colonics. And where are you performing this work? Uh, that's in the same uh, physical building as where the Hill Center for Integrative Medicine was. And what kind of business is currently operating there? A chiropractic practice. How many chiropractors work there now? One. And does it offer any medical services? No. There is one uh, physician medical physician that rents space there on Thursdays when no other uh, chiropractic patients are there. Uh, no chiropractic staff is there either. Um, so it's strictly a rental of space. His main practice is in Turlock, which is just south of Modesto. What kind of doctor is it? He's a vascular surgeon. Um, if we turn to the next page, BC 10, can you tell us about these other jobs that you've been doing since you surrendered your license? Yes, uh, listed at the top of the page, landscaping maintenance handyman. Uh, that was uh, being done at, uh, for a property management company and uh, just taking, taking care of general maintenance, cleaning roof gutters, uh, Sprinklers, parking lot, uh, you know, stuff like that, repairing trim on the building, uh, garbage, enclosures, trim and plants, that type of stuff. Excuse me. Uh, uh, this is Dr. Paris. Can, Judge Wong, can I can I interject here that um, if if we could perhaps focus this more on rehabilitative efforts than um, running point by point through the uh, through the submitted packet. 
it seems like some of the things that we're going over are um, fairly, we've, we've read that, we've, we've acknowledged the, the, the various jobs that he's had from 2016 on, et cetera. And, and we'd like to hear more about, um, you know, the rehabilitative efforts to date. So, Ms. Hendrickson, if you would focus your your examination on on uh, those areas. Absolutely. So, turning to back to the first page of your CV, one of the big changes you've made is entering medical school. How did that come about? I have always had a love for learning and especially science. Before becoming a chiropractor, but even more so after becoming a chiropractor and keeping up on my education, I felt that I would go ahead and and uh, work at taking the aptitude test, uh, the MCAT test. Did really well on it. Uh, applied to med medical school and got accepted. And how many years of medical school do you have left? Two years. And if your license is reinstated, do you intend to stay in medical school? Yes. If your license is reinstated, how much do you plan to work as a chiropractor while in medical school? I'll be able to work 10 to 15 hours during that time. What is your plan after medical school? I'll be applying for a residency program and that's a three year program. Okay, is there any particular area that you're interested in as far as a residency program? Yes, emergency medicine. And why does emergency medicine uh, interest you? Emergency medicine interests me because it, it takes in a, a broad spectrum of patients and conditions and it'll, it, it'll expose me to a lot of different conditions. I have to learn more about uh, various conditions at, at all all age groups, and it's very interesting to me. And how long is a residency program? Three years. And if your license is reinstated, do you plan to work as a chiropractor while you're completing your residency program? Yes. And how do you plan to work as a chiropractor then? It would be limited and probably still stay at about 10 to 15 hours per week. Okay. And at uh, second page of your CV at the top here on page BCE 9. Can you tell us briefly what this um, information is? These are courses that I've taken so far in medical school. These are the basic sciences, the exact courses, the credits, and the hours spent in those courses. Okay. And if we turn to BCE 28. Can you explain to us what we're looking at here? That's a breakdown per per semester. You can see MD1, MD2, MD3, MD4, um, and then the teachers that would have been teaching those courses. And then turning to your CV on page 10, you list various professional associations, both chiropractic and professional, I'm sorry, both chiropractic and medical associations on your CV. Um, are those uh, associations that you're active in at this time? Yes. And are these, uh, which of these associations have you joined since you've surrendered your license? The North American Spine Society, uh, American Medical Association, uh, American College of Emergency Physicians, and Phi Chi Medical Fraternity. And are any of these associations listed on your CV particularly meaningful to you? Yes, uh, they're organizations that particularly are emphasis on the specialty that I want to pursue uh, in the future, as well as crossing over um, information that would pertain with, chiro with chiropractic as well. Um, on the next page, BC 11, you list current literature, current, uh, literature reviewed and studied. 
Um, is this, can you tell us what these journals are? Are these journals, uh, I'm sure the, the, the board recognizes these, uh, Journal of Manip Manipulative and Physical Therapy, Spine Journal, Annals of Emergency Medicine. These are um, just some of the journals that I look at uh, periodically, either quarterly or uh, monthly. And have you continued to review these even after your license was surrendered? Yes. Yes, I love, have a, a great interest in learning and keeping my mind fresh. It's, uh, it's a little geeky there. Um, underneath that is a research publication listed. Uh, can you tell us what, um, tell us about that? Yes, uh, there were four others and myself that conducted a research project that uh, we were very excited about and was published last month in uh, September in the Harvard Public Health Review. And so uh, the, um, it was a research project on COVID during the pandemic. And why did that area of it? Uh, why was that an area of interest for you? Well, it uh, it was uh, a very uh, interesting topic since we were in the pandemic, something that none of us had ever been experiencing before, as well as addressing the personal interaction between the the patients not being able to receive any type of assistance from their family or friends while uh, under medical care. And if we turn to BCE 37 to page 50, um, can you identify this document for us? Yes, that's the, the actual publication uh, from the Harvard um, Public Health Review. And you mentioned in your letter as well as just a little bit ago that church um, as far as church being a big part of your life, can you tell us about that? Sure. Church has been a huge, huge uh, pillar of um, support for my myself and my family, um, and just. Uh, a wonderful thing to be encouraged and uh, have our faith strengthened and uh, being able to have our friends that are like minded uh, being so understanding and loving and, and caring. It's something that uh, we've been involved with years prior to all of this happening through through this, even till through today. Um, I, I, have the privilege of serving as a as an elder in the congregation and to be able to be of service to the congregation um, in in various ways. So for some of us that don't know, when you're an elder in the church, can you tell us what kind of time commitment that means? Uh, the time can be anywhere from you know, 12 to 20 hours a month, up to 100 hours a month, depending upon what's what's going on. Different families may need more help um, or more assistance. Uh, during the first part of the pandemic, there was a lot of work that was needed to be done for reassurance and making sure people had supplies and food and toilet paper and all that type of stuff. So uh, there was quite a bit involved in that. And as an elder, what does that mean? What is your role as an elder? What are you, are you a leader in the church? What are you doing? Um, it's really a servant. We're servants. Um, where the qualifications are to be a spiritually mature man. Um, not, doesn't have to do with your age, but um, that uh, you think, oh, it's an elevated position, but it's actually a lower position because we're we're servants to the the folks in the congregation to help them. And so, do 
do you believe that what happened through this process with the board, you were able to teach others through your church lessons? Well, I know my faith was very much strengthened. And as such, I know that um, my wife and I have been able to encourage others too because of it. On your CV, you list uh, some missionary ministry work and volunteer work. Is that since you surrendered your license? We've been doing that for years and uh, it continues on still throughout all of this that's been going on. So was volunteer work always a part of your life even before you surrendered? Yeah. yeah going back, my wife and I have always been involved with Make-A-Wish Foundation or Children's Crisis Center. We even have a program in the office for cancer survivors called the Triumph Fitness Program. That was, um, so we're always looking for ways to, to help out the community. Um, if we turn to page 29, there are documents from 29 to 35. Can you tell us about what those documents are? Yeah, yeah that was, um, that was a, a canned food drive that I helped to coordinate, um, at the, the office. Where, uh, where I do colonics as well as a hair salon next door. I had heard that the, the Children's Crisis Center, uh, when the pandemic hit, people, you know, they were hunkering down at home, but they were forgetting to donate food and things to the children. And uh, they were having a hard time. And so I thought, well, let's go ahead and get some canned food for these guys. And so we, uh, we're able to raise a, a truckload of food and uh, take it over to them. So these were just uh, thank you, thank you letters and pictures and stuff from that. So these aren't acts that you've done because you surrendered. These are just acts that you did even prior to, and you will always be doing. Yep, keep doing it. Um, I noticed that. Looking at these documents, it refers to Hill Chiropractic. Yes. Can uh, you explain that? Um, the the chiropractor, Dr. Anderson, who's there, uh, has a, a DBA doing business as uh, Hill Chiropractic. And the reason why is because the practice has been there for, I don't know, 35 years or so, and has a great reputation in the community. And so he, he felt that he wanted to keep that name. So even despite what happened, do you have a lot of support in the community? Yes, yes, quite a bit. I want to ask you about something on your CV. If we look at page 11, or page 9, BCE 9, sorry, you told me about a story and I want you to share it. Um, under awards, you received number one chiropractic award 11 years in a row. Yeah. And one of those awards you told me um, you received after um, you surrendered your license. Um, and so first of all, can you tell me what this award is? Uh, through how you receive this award? Well, the the newspaper in town, uh, we have one newspaper for, you know, the three or 400,000 people in the area, um, it's the Modesto B. And so every year they set out to all the readers of the, the newspaper, a survey of, to vote on their number one restaurant or number one healthcare provider, or number one chiropractor and, uh, so this is by popular vote, and we have, we have nothing to do with it other than hopefully providing good service to warrant it. Um, and so even after surrendering my license, uh, 
months later, about six to nine months after that, uh, we were still, I was still selected Modesto's number one chiropractor. And so, and it was well known in your community what occurred when your office was shut down. Isn't yeah, that correct? It was actually on the front page of the Modesto beat. Yes, it was well known and on the internet as well. So, despite what happened, a lot of people still appreciated your services and still supported you. Is that correct? Correct. Um, if we turn to BCE 36, you included a picture here of a, it says Phi Chi Medical Fraternity. Can you tell us what that is? Since starting medical school, I uh, was able to join Phi Chi uh, Medical Fraternity, which is uh, one of the largest medical fraternities in the world, and particularly internationally. And if we turn to um, BC 12, this is a index of the various continuing education that you took over the last six years. And my question is, why did you continue to take continuing education each year that you surrendered your license? I, I really truly have a, an interest in learning and continuing to learn. Um, always been that, that guy that goes to way more uh, seminars during the year than, than you have to, uh, just because it's interesting. And I also wanted to make sure that if I ever had hopes of being in front of you today, like I am, uh, that I'd be able to keep current with all of the, the latest information in chiropractic. Um, have you manipulated any patients since you surrendered your license? No. And if you were reinstated, do you feel you'd be competent to manipulate patients again? Yes. Why do you say that? The academic side of for sure kept current uh, on continuing education as well as the uh, going back through all of the basic sciences, which has been a great education as well. On the, the practical side of it, as far as uh, adjusting patients, that's something that I had done for decades, and uh, I know that I would be able to perform that and that uh, patients could trust that I would do an excellent job for them. When you were picking out courses, was there any particular areas that you focused on? Yes. Can you tell us about that? I, I remembered the accusations in the um, Board's uh, paperwork, and I wanted to make sure that I went through and took courses specifically on those so that I would make sure that I would know maybe where I'm missing certain points or, or get myself up to date on uh, documentation or ethics and law, those types of categories. So that I wouldn't cause myself problems or anybody else in the future. And so your way of addressing the board's second amendment accusation was to take courses specific to those areas? Yes. You received letters of support from various individuals. Um, one of them was Dr. Jeff Anderson. If the board agrees to reinstate your license, you understand that you may be placed on a period of probation, correct? Yes. And if you're placed on probation, you may need a practice monitor, correct? Correct. And so who is Dr. Jeff Anderson? Dr. Anderson is currently the owner of Hill Chiropractic, and he 
opposed that practice and has, um, in, in his letter even, uh, stated that he would be willing to be a, a monitor for me. Uh, he has uh, vast knowledge in chiropractic care. Uh, he's even been an instructor at the chiropractic college. And he has agreed to supervise you? Yes. And if you were to practice, what, um, I'm sorry, if you, as far as the other people who wrote letters, can you tell us why you asked those people to write those letters for you? Yes, the, this is a, a, a good cross section of uh, folks that I've known for years. They've known me prior to any of this uh, license uh, surrendering or, or accusations, and they've still known me till till today. Uh, they they are from different professions, whether uh, law enforcement or healthcare or or other professions. So I felt that they would be a good cross section of uh, opinions that the board could use and and know. That they could contact them if they had questions about me. Um, finally, I want to discuss your motivations and why reinstatement is important to you. Um, and you understand you were required to reimburse the board for all of its costs. And you submitted a check for forty-four thousand one hundred seventy-seven dollars. Um, and also indicated that you basically working as a handyman and going to school and your average income is around 18,000 a year right now. Yeah, 18 to 20 something, yeah. And you also said in your letter that you're on Medi-Cal, low income, government assistance and food programs. Yes. Are you someone that wants to be on those programs? No. I uh, I'm glad that they're in existence because I, I know firsthand of the benefits of them, but I, I do not uh, care to continue to be on them. I would rather contribute to, to them through paying taxes than to be receiving it. Okay. Um. If you were able to work part time as a chiropractor, would you be able to make the income to not be on these programs? Yes. So, how were you able to raise the money for this petition? Uh, there was not going to be any way that uh, that I was going to be able to raise it with the money that I've been earning. Uh, that we barely get by as it is. Uh, my my father, he's in his nineties. Offered to give me the money to do it, and it's a lot of money. You know, it's two years income for us, uh, over two years. And uh, my wife and I prayed about this very seriously because it's a big, a big gamble for us. That there's so many other things that we need to take care of. Uh, leaky roofs and we're driving old cars and all kinds of stuff and to put out forty four thousand dollars it's like well we've got to do this and that we're we've got to be serious about this and get that license back start helping people start earning money and be a contributor rather than taking from the system what are other reasons reinstatement is important to you when when I surrendered my license. Uh, it's that's a huge part of my life. I've been a chiropractor for over half of my life, and it's a huge part of me, who I am, how I think, and how I act. And I, I want to be a practicing chiropractor again. The other part is that I never felt that it was going to be the end of my story. You know, surrendering my license, I always had a hope of getting my license back to.
continue to help. Do you feel that the What did you learn from all of this? I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I learned that that just because I think that something might be okay, it's not okay. Even if if I have the right intention. That if somebody else feels that it's something else, that that I blurred the blurred the the edges or the borders. Uh, I don't ever want to be in that situation ever again. I know that I will never put myself or allow myself to be put in this position again. As far as uh, having my own practice, even. Becoming a medical doctor, I plan on working in the hospitals as far as that goes. And so, if you could be specific on what you would do differently besides working um, for someone else. Make sure that when when I'm practicing chiropractic, just stick to chiropractic and, and not do anything else. You know, adjust. That's what I do really well. Stick to that. How can the board be assured that the public is safe if you were to, if your license were to be reinstated? Well, I, I hope that the the board. Uh, when when you look at all of this information, this evidence and testimony that you and see the person that I am, the quality of person that I am, uh, the accusations don't accurately reflect the the true person that I am. I am a person of faith, and my friends and associates are people of faith, and. Uh, know for a fact that um, board can trust me you can trust me in caring for patients and for sticking within the scope and doing an excellent job i don't have any other questions mr stone cross-examination thank you uh, have you made uh, New York uh, aware of your California discipline? No, I have not. So, as far as you know, uh, your New York licensure, uh, th that entity is not aware of your uh, surrender of California license for chiropractic? I am not aware of that. And you, you, you talked about, you paid uh, costs of approximately $44,000 um, uh, to the, to the board. Uh, and you talked about how you, you know, that's 2 years of, of your income. Um, but you didn't, you didn't, you didn't mention how you came up with that money. How did you come up with the money to pay that? Oh, oh, I apologize for that. Uh, my, my father, uh, he's in his nineties. He gave that money to me. Now, going back to the underlying discipline, uh, the business you were in, um, that was called the Hill Center. Is that right? Yes. And that, uh, and you were practicing integrated medicine. Um, personally, I was practicing chiropractic, but in the practice, it was integrative medicine. Correct. Okay, so your advert the Hill Center provided more than chiropractic services, correct, correct. Uh, including the Hill Diet. Is that right? Correct. And can you tell me about the Hill Diet? Uh, the Hill Diet was a HCG diet, HCG based diet, 
and uh, so anything else specifically did you want to know well um you were providing uh customers of the hill center with um services healthcare services well beyond chiropractic correct um the medical doctor was providing uh, medical care and uh pharmaceuticals uh, on the chiropractic side, we were providing chiropractic care and physiotherapy, correct? Yeah, but it was the Hill Center, it was the Hill Diet. Um, I get the impression, especially since you're in medical school now, that you have a holistic approach, that you have a number of different healthcare interests, chiropractic being one of them, is that right? Um, well, uh, my primary interest has been chiropractic. I have had other interests like acupuncture uh, and um, exercise, those types of things. Yes. Colonic yes. therapies. You do that as a profession. Colonic therapies, right? yes. Colonic mm -hmm. therapies, yes. You're in the business of that, right? Uh, you, I am in the business of colonic therapy, yes. And you hope to be in the biz business of medicine, right? Um, well, I, I would say. Uh, Looking forward to being an employee, yes. Right, but but you're uh, you're interested in being uh, a professional physician, correct? Working in an emergency room, those types of things. I think you said correct, correct. Yeah, so you have a number of interests in the healthcare field, but beside chiropractic, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, and how is it that you can? Um, and do you understand that you had difficulties and ultimately surrendered your license in relation to um, uh, exceeding the scope of chiropractic practice in a manner that was likely to uh, endanger the health and, and safety of, of the members of the public, correct? Could you restate that as a question? As a question? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, let, let, yeah, sure. Um, and, uh, among the, the, the things that caused you to surrender your, your license were the allegations against you that you were um, uh, providing health care treatment, so to speak, uh, that exceeded the scope of your chiropractic practice. Is that right? Well, um, the as far as the as far as my understanding, uh, when I applied for this petition, under the terms of my surrender, all the allegations and charges were deemed admitted and I accepted them. Well, do you, do you believe that you were acting um, and providing um, uh, services to your uh, chiropractic clients that were outside of the scope of chiropractic practice? Um, I'm going to object unless we can specifically do you want to point to where it says that in the accusation? Because I am I think you're misstating the accusation. You don't think there was a cause for discipline for conduct exceeding the scope of uh, practice for, for performing services outside just, the scope? I don't think that's what you just said. I think that you said something different. Conduct exceeding the scope of practice. Conduct outside of the scope of practice, conduct likely to engage, likely to endanger the health safety. Why are we rehashing the causes for discipline? Well, I'm 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 trying not to. I just try, I'm, what I'm trying to understand is, um, see, since he has many interests in uh, healthcare, how um, uh, how he now will be able to separate those interests when Why don't you ask him that question. That, that was my question that he asked me to rephrase. So, the, the best I can do uh, was to um, uh, cite to the uh, causes for discipline in, in relation to his practice outside of the scope and ask him with his interests in outside. In like Why don't you just re-ask re the question instead of explaining what you're trying to do? So, ask him the question so he could give an answer. Sure. Um, you, you were in trouble before with the board 
for practicing outside of the scope of chiropractic in terms of your other interests uh, in healthcare. Um, how can you now, um, with your interests continuing and even expanding, how can you now um, uh, show that to the board that you uh, understand and will not practice uh, outside of the scope of chiropractic to your patients? Well, I think that's a very well stated question and. Uh, it only took me 10 minutes. Oh, hey, I appreciate that. <laughs> the, um, the first, the first part of that is that. I've learned more about each area specifically. Uh, about ethics about standards about uh, scopes of practices. Uh, and my my hopes and prayer is to receive my chiropractic license reinstated soon and to become a chiropractor again to be able to practice and i know all all too well uh, where that where that scope of practice is and i have no intention of getting near the the edge of that at all uh, I also know where the scope of practice is in medicine too, and so uh, when, when, and uh, if, if and when I do become a practicing medical physician, uh, that will be a scope that I will uh, need to practice in within also. Well, what have you learned since you essentially, uh, let's say? Uh, Operated in the gray area or bled your uh, interests in various different fields of healthcare providing into your chiropractic practice. What have you learned uh, specifically um, that you didn't know at that time that will allow you to uh, provide safe chiropractic care to your patients without uh, that extending into your other interests? Okay, uh, I think that's a very very well structured question. The uh, the way that I plan on approaching this is making sure that I'm in a practice that solely practices chiropractic, and there are no other medical possibilities or options just in the next treatment room or down the hallway. That's that's my first major buffer to to staying away from that at all. Uh, any type of medical care that that my patient might need will be referred out for that. Do you intend to stop practicing, for example, with uh, colonics or uh, diet issues? Th those other interests of yours? Do you intend on not practicing at all in those endeavors, healthcare endeavors? Uh, I. I highly doubt they they uh, they recently uh, hired another colonic therapist in the practice, so I highly doubt that I'll uh, be doing colonics once I become a chiropractor again. And as far as diet goes, uh, that there are certain certain dietary recommendations, nutritional recommendations that are that still remain within the chiropractic scope of practice, which uh, I would hope that I could still be able to offer uh, advice in those areas. And 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 what will you do um, when your other interests in healthcare um, and your other knowledge about uh, healthcare issues, whether it's diet or medicine? Um, how will you know and how will you deal with situations with chiropractic patients um, when those other issues come up. You mean as far as referring out? Um, it, it, however, you would uh, you would deal with um, your other opinions uh, that you have in relation to your other healthcare interests. Uh, well, the uh, probably the most direct answer to that would be uh, when I would see the necessity for care that. That I wouldn't provide, whether it was imaging like a CT scan or MRI or 
or somebody uh, injecting a joint or something like that, I'd definitely refer those patients out, even if it were uh, something to do with uh, nutritional things that that uh, that were outside of what was being done in the office. And and right now there's a, there's nothing as far as diet goes uh, going on in that practice. Um, and then just uh, finally, real quick, I, I think you mentioned that in your continuing education, you tried to focus on the types of issues, um, the types of education that would assist you um, in, in relation to um, the types of things that, that led to your discipline before. I, I was looking at um, the summary that you have of your education at BCE page 12. There may be some other information in there, but can you... Um, can you tell me or point me uh, what type of education um, you believe you've uh, you've undertaken that relate to the um, causes for discipline that led to your surrender? Sure. sure. Uh, item number four would be the first one. Um, I think one of the accusations had mentioned something about examination or limited exam or no exam. Uh, this one was specifically on exam and documentation of those examinations. Item number five was ethics and law. Uh, item number seven had to do with ethical personal injury documentation, which further uh, covered examinations, more documentation and reporting. Uh, item number nine, another ethics and law course. Uh, item number 12, ethics and law. Um, number 14, CCA professional boundaries, scope of practice, absolutely uh, within uh, what, what uh, I was looking to make sure that we went over or I went over. And number 17, physical examination documentation. Item number 18, more ethics and law. Um, item number 22, exam documentation. Number 23, ethics and law. Uh, item number 26, examination documentation. Number 28, ethics. Number 30, ethics. Uh, number 33, examination, exam documentation. Number 35, ethics. Number 37, ethics and law. Those were the ones that were referred to. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I don't have anything further. Right. Ms. Hendrickson, anything on redirect? Um, no, Your Honor. All right. So I'll turn it to the board for any questions. Uh, Dr. Paris, do you have any questions? Um, I do. I have a few questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Hill, for being here today. And I uh, commend your efforts on uh, rehabilitation and uh, especially your continuing education. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify. So it was mentioned um, that I believe the question was asked uh, by Ms. Hendrickson about uh, whether or not the New York board had contacted you regarding California. Was that I, the phrasing of that question? Um, I, I yeah, the board. The if board we later said part. that no, it, that was not true, or if that was uh, no, they have not contacted. Me. And and uh, you did not uh, seek to investigate whether or not your your license there those rules and regulations would have required you to notify them. No, um, it's I, I hadn't planned on going back there to practice, and that wasn't something. But that you were holding a license, so I'm wondering you 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 would still have to adhere to their rules and regulations, correct? Correct, and I did. I would submit my uh, my CEs uh, every time I would complete CEUs uh, that they would be sent back to them. I'm just trying to get into the mindset of um, acknowledging that you had surrendered a license in California, and and um, like why you didn't think that maybe that might be important for New York. I don't know. It just didn't come to mind, I guess. Okay, thank you. Um, my, my 2nd question is, uh. 
you noted, it was noted during testimony also that you're active with the American Chiropractic Association, California Chiropractic Association. You listed them as active memberships. And I'm wondering if you can just tell me the membership type that you have, what your involvement is that was stated. Okay, and those are, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the, la the last couple of years, I've been a student and so, as such, uh, my membership is student membership in most of these organizations because there's no way I can afford to full memberships in these organizations. Most most of them, as a student, uh, are free to me to belong to, and I can uh, receive their their ongoing information through their journals and uh, information that way. And um, or it's minimal cost, like 35 bucks or 50 bucks or something. Yes. Um, so are you, I, I was asking specifically about the chiropractic related organizations. Are you stating that you have an active student membership with the American Chiropractic Association and the California Chiropractic Association? Yes. Okay. And what is your involvement with them, if any, either one of those organizations? Yes. Just as a, a passive student, I okay. haven't I haven't gone to any national meetings or anything like that. Okay. And do you? Um, and I have a question about. Do you know the timeline on um, when did H HCG become a Schedule Three controlled substance? I uh, know that. Okay. I have no information on or knowledge of any of that stuff. That was all done by the medical director and no idea about that. It, it never was. That's fair. What's that? It's not alleged in the accusation that it was. It's not a schedule three. Um, it's are you stating it's not currently? It never was. HCG was never a schedule three. Okay. Okay. That was a um, misstatement of the allegation. And I have one more question. And HCG was never. Never mind. I I was reading that it was part of the Hill Diet. Was it not? Yes, but oh. there was never an allegation that it was a scheduled medication. I think the deputy attorney general just got confused about the allegations. That wasn't one of the allegations. It was another medication that was a scheduled medication. Well, I, I was referring to BC 74, the second amendment accusation, testosterone. A steroid yeah. and schedule three controlled substance pursuant to health and safety code section one one zero five six. Right, that was a different medication. That wasn't GHCG. That wasn't the Hill Diet. And so, I just want to have um, clarity on. So, for the the fifteen listed causes for discipline, I, I was I, I I'm I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly, Mr. Hill. I, my understanding is that by filing the petition before us today, and if if we go to BCE 66, uh, paragraph four, it, it, it towards the bottom, it reads that uh, respondent must comply with all the laws, regulations, and procedures for reinstatement of a revoked license in effect at the time the petition is filed. And all of the charges and allegate allegations contained in second amendment accusation number 2013-974 shall be deemed true, correct, and admitted by respondent when the board determines whether to grant or deny the petition. That's true, but HCG is not a testosterone. I, I'm not I'm let, okay, we can move on from HCG. That's um, all I was trying I'm, to say. I'm sorry. I was just trying to that up for you. I'm sorry, Mr. So, Ms. Hendrickson, you're you're out of order. Um, Dr. Paris is asking. Um, I apologize, Mr. Hill. A question. I mean, you certainly could object, but you can't argue with with the board member. 
I didn't mean it come across that way, so I apologize again. I'm well. Okay, we'll, we can move on. Um, uh, so I'm just wondering if if you were aware of that section. Yes. Okay, and and you do agree with that that you accept that these are deemed to be true, correct, and admitted. Those. Yeah, and, 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 and. It's my understanding that when I applied for the petition under the terms of my surrender, all allegations and charges were deemed admitted and I accept that. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. I was, it wasn't clear. I was, I wasn't necessarily hearing that directly. So I appreciate that. And then I have 1 last um, question when, um, when I look at the support statements uh, submitted. And I'm going to find them here. What were, was anyone contacted um, about the of language or verbiage that should be in those? What? Were they freely written or were they guided? Was anyone contacted? Did either you or anyone reach out to those people to give them guidance on? So, what what I did. Uh, I knew that I had to provide some letters from the community as well as from a couple of chiropractors. And there are certain things that the board wanted included or the, uh, the paperwork. I know that they, they wanted included in that. So the only way that these people would have known would be if I let them know what, what to make sure to put on there. The, like the statement at the bottom that they had to really be serious about it under penalty of perjury that they were given their statement. They, they, that was something that they had to know was serious about it. Um, I went ahead and copied off everything off of the, the board's website as far as the accusations so that I could provide that to each one of the people that, um, that provided the letters because I didn't. I, wanted, I didn't want to have any doubt that they knew what was going on, uh, that there was clarity and exactly what they were signing or, or uh, you know, if they didn't feel comfortable with it, they didn't have to do it. But they, I wanted to make sure that they had all the information before they wrote anything. And I told each one of them that to know that they could be contacted by you or somebody at the board to verify that they had actually reviewed this information. So take it seriously before you write anything down, um, know what you're, know what you're doing. So there was, you know, uh, a couple of things, you know, as far as what they were to attest to, but everything else uh, was, was their, their originality. Thank you. I have no further questions. Uh, Dr. Adams, any questions? Uh, yeah, um, I, I'm having a little bit of difficulty ascertaining really the level of, of understanding on your part, Mr. Hill, about the gravity of of what you've admitted to it it seems as though that you're you're admitting to it because you have to this is just my take um and so i'm i'm a little concerned about a couple things you seem to be very bright you seem to be interested in studying and learning but yet you're 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 expecting us to to accept, which I'm having a hard time with, that you wouldn't think that disclosing to New York, whether you plan to practice there or not, that your license in California had been disciplined and the reasons for that. I'm wondering if you've disclosed to your medical school that you have had your license revoked. Are they aware that you've had a, a license as a healthcare practitioner revoked? Uh, nobody has asked me that, and 
as far as New York. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So, so New York hasn't asked, but well, the, but the school was... the school asked for a background check. So, uh, they recently ran a background check on me. And they might be looking for criminal aspects, you know, as as instead of related to a board situation. So, I I just think that you know disclosure, because if you get your license, your chiropractic license back, you're going to have to disclose all of this to every patient. You know, and I would think that if you get your medical license, your medical board is probably going to want the same thing. I, I haven't checked with the CMA, but I would think that the CMA is going to want, would want to know this. I would think that that would be important for them. Obviously, it's important to us as, as, a, as a California. You, you know, for all we know, you, you could have been practicing. You could have moved to New York and, and practiced there if they didn't ask. It just, I just, I'm having a hard time because you, you're conveying someone who is coming, you know, that that in, interests themselves in studying and learning, yet you're coming across like, well, you know, no one asked for anything. So I, so I guess it's clear to me you didn't think that that would be important in in part of your rehabilitation to acknowledge to everybody, which you're going to have to if you get your license back. You're going to have to disclose it anyway. Um, You've talked about having financial hardship, um, and I sympathize with you, empathize, I can't, I, I, actually, because I have a, a child that has a very serious health condition. So I, I empathize with you about the situation with your family and what drove you to to want to do these other things as a chiropractor. But you had to know, having taken your oath as a chiropractor, that you couldn't do those things. Are, are, do you really have a sense of, of remorse and and the and the the seriousness of, of of what some of the people that had this care in your facility? Because I, I understand you're a forty nine percent holder and you had a fifty one percent doctor. He wasn't really there. It's clear from the allegations you admitted to that that doctor wasn't really there. That the people that you were talking to thought you were the guy. And and, and these medications may have been administered by somebody else, but it was under your watch and they trusted you. And that's what we're here to do. So do you understand the gravity of that and what, what it is our, we're tasked with as a board? Absolutely. I, you have a very weighty responsibility and it, I am aware that every single patient that I see from here on out uh, will receive notice before they receive any type of treatment from me about these these board actions uh, that have taken place. And uh, I I don't know exactly, you know, just like yourself, I'm not aware exactly how um, the medical board will will handle it, um, but. As far as the knowing and as far as being remorseful, I am absolutely, I am absolutely taking responsibility. I'm sorry for anything, any type of difficulty that I have caused anybody. Okay. That has been constantly on my mind and on my heart for over six years. Something that I have taken heavy, heavy responsibility for, and I still do. And it's something that uh, I don't know how to take more responsibility or, you know, any, any type of, uh, restitution or whatever, nothing else is left to be done. Um, I, I think, I think there is, I think disclosing to the proper people is, is more. More. And I think I, 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 what I, what I honestly, I, I, I kind of feel terrible in a sense because I fear 
that when you disclose to your to your medical school that you've been disciplined by the board and that you're coming here late to that, you could jeopardize what you've already moved towards. I mean, I you know, I I want you I want you to do what you want to do. And if you want to be a medical medical doctor, be a medical doctor. But you're jeopardizing your family in other ways too by not being fully and completely honest with the entities that you're involved with. And you could, you could, I don't know, but you could disclose to your school what has happened, and they might say, "We're really sorry, Mr. Hill, but we can't, we can't let you continue." And you've made this three-year investment, but that's not a decision for me to make. I have to make a decision based on today, and um, so um, I thank you for your time. I have no other questions. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cruz, any questions? Uh, no questions for me, questions I had were already asked. Great, thank you. Dr. Daniels, any questions? Uh, yes, hi, I have a few questions. Um, so just to sort of echo what Dr. Adams was saying, um, on the New York's uh, licensing page for enforcement, um, they do not allow uh, unlicensed person to, to perform activities requiring a license. And on page BCE 82, um, uh, one of the eighth cause for discipline is allowing yourself or an employee who is unlicensed to furnish a controlled substance. Um, so on your previous page, you had said that you had blurred the lines. Um, and I'm just wondering, how that is not a clear uh, boundary between chiropractic and medicine. Which line was that again? In here. Well, to jump off what Dr. Adams uh, was talking about, New York clearly uh, enforces uh, disciplinary action for anyone who practices beyond the scope of chiropractic. Additionally, uh, they uh, provide disciplinary action for uh, a chiropractor permitting or aiding an unlicensed person, i.e. staff, to perform activities requiring a license. And so handing somebody a controlled substance such as testosterone is practicing outside of chiropractic and an unlicensed person is not allowed to do that. And so on page BCE 82, one of the causes for discipline is that you or an employee furnished a controlled substance to a patient. In the introductory, in your response, it said that you uh, felt bad and that you made a mistake because your business model was erroneous. And secondly, that you blurred the lines between chiropractic and medicine. So I would just like, I'm having a difficult time in understanding how that's blurred. To me, it's quite clear. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that. Um, well, I'm, I'm under oath right now and you're putting me in a situation to perjure myself. So I'm trying to abide by the board's rules while truthfully taking responsibility for those actions that I can take responsibility for. Okay, um, on BCE uh, 81, um, the uh, patient stated that uh, they were never um, uh, informed of, is it Dr. Zeller, is that how I pronounce that? Yes, yes. Uh, so they were never informed uh, of their existence, so they were completely un unaware uh, that they uh, existed, and um, so I'm wondering, was the were those patients not made aware of Dr. Zeller? I mean, that's what the testimony seems like. Um, Again, this just further with Dr. Adams saying that these patients were not aware of the medical doctor who appeared to be there a very short amount of time during the week. 
the the, the answer of the answer to that question, the question is that is, uh, the the patients weren't the chiropractic. I'm sorry, this is the reporter. This is the reporter. I can't hear you. I'm hearing you. I am too. Oh. Is your no my my microphone Hello? isn't off. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, but those patients weren't chiropractic patients, and um, the the chiropractic regulations as far as uh, the scope of practice for them uh, would would not necessarily be applying to them. The patients were never given uh, medications from me. Um, I, I never gave anybody testosterone. I never gave anybody HCG. Um, I never gave anybody any type of hormones. Um, all I did was gather information for the medical doctor. The medical doctor provided the care and the medical staff provided the care for the patients. So just to confirm, you're saying that you uh, did not interact with these patients and that it was the uh, medical person's uh, unlicensed staff that did. It was medical personnel that interacted with them. Um, it was Dr. Zeller who prescribed the medication. Uh, Dr. Zeller's name was on the prescription. Um, it was never me um, who provided that. Of those, the medical staff performed all vitals and uh, examination of the patients. Uh, so anything that uh, is commenting about uh, as far as chiropractic scope of practice about the patient not being examined, uh, they weren't examined because they weren't a chiropractic patient, not examined by me. They weren't my patient. They were Dr. Zeller. Dr. Zeller. Okay, thank you. No, no more questions. All right, I believe that's all the members of the board, but I'll check back to see if any other members have uh, thought of any subsequent questions. Uh, any further questions from the board? One quick question, just so I can kind of clarify timeline in my mind. When did uh, you receive your New York license for chiropractic care? Ooh, it was in the, the early to mid 90s. Okay, like all right. Just wanted to kind of get the timeline. Thank you. Yeah, it was according to the record, oh, Ms. Cruz, it was 1995. Oh, 19. All right. Any further questions from the board? Yes, Your Honor. I just have one clarification. I just, I just, I just, I guess I want to be really, really unblurred to use the word that's been used already, blurred lines. So I, I, I'm unclear what exactly it is that, that you're admitting to, Mr. Hill, when you say that you never that that these patients that we're talking about in this in this accusation that you've admitted to in order to file this petition, that you that these were treated by the medical side, you were doing the chiropractic side, yet we have we have statement after statement after statement after statement here saying that you were the one that was recommending these things. It may have been Dr. Zeller's on the pill box, but it was you that they thought was their treating physician. Now, so help me understand, I'm confused what exactly it is that you're acknowledging. If you're not, if you're not owning the fact that medications controlled substances were were provided to under direction that you were you, you you didn't necessarily administer them you didn't put the testosterone in their mouth or administer the injections or the ivs per se but you made recommendations that's what the patients believed 
I so never I'm, made medical recommendations. So, so in these statements where somebody says respondent recommended, you know, the man shot versus the woman shot, that wasn't you? No. Which, which accusation so was that? Who's the respondent here then? I, I thought you were the respondent, not Dr. Zellers. Where are you looking? Which, which line item and which accusation? Which point of discipline? Uh, there's several here as I've looked through. Uh, there's, I mean, BCE 79, 81, 82. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking, 83, looking. 84. Yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of them. I, I, I'm just not understanding when you say that you didn't do it. I'm looking I, at 79. Where do you see it on 79? If the doctor, if the doctor was there and recommending these things, um, here's one: Pat patient E.K. on or about July 31st. 2013 patient EK had his initial consultation with respondent. Is that you, Dr. Dr. Mr. Hill? You're the respondent? No. You're not the respondent on page BCE 00078, item 33. Oh. On or about July 31st, 2013, patient EK had his initial Consultation with respondent in regards to obtaining nutritional IVs and vitamin C and amino acids from respondent. Patient EK was informed that a registered nurse named Michelle on staff at respondent's facility would place the IV into his arm. Help me understand I never, that. I never Help saw you. that patient. So then why would you admit to this 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 item about patient EK? I'm under the understanding that this is not litigating, relitigating the case. And I, I'm not relitigating. I'm asking a question about understanding. We we have a situation here where 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 a, a line was crossed, and you've admitted to the blurring of the line between chiropractic and medicine. And we have these facts before us that we are assuming you've attested to because they've been submitted here as part of this of this file. I don't know how you can all of a sudden back away and say, that's not you. My understanding, and, and maybe I need clarification here from the attorney general, when it, in this document, when it says respondent, couldn't I just put in that place Brent Hill? So Dr. Adams, this is Judge Wong. Perhaps I could shed some light. Um, your, your... Um, confusion and 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 questions. I, I I understand the basis for it, um, but I I I think what we have is a situation where um, you you basically you have a person giving conflicting testimony. Um, if, that, and, if that's the answer, Your Honor, I'll just say I'll leave it at that because that's what I'm hearing and that's my concern. And I'm just trying to make sure I'm clear on the facts. Yeah, um, I, 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 believe, I believe you are, Dr. Adams. Okay. Can I so, clarify uh, this specific patient? Because it's very easy for you to recognize that there's some problems with this statement and inaccuracies that you will see, they will immediately grab your eye when you, when I point these out, when you look at it. Well, wait a second, before you proceed, because I don't want you to incriminate yourself, you just testified under oath that you never saw this patient. So how would you be able to clarify anything that pertains to patient EK if you just stated that it wasn't you and you never saw the patient? I can talk to you about a timeline that was drawn incorrectly in this report. And I know Wouldn't about the, the, the refund of the patient. Handled? I know about the refund of the patient that is uh, talking about. I'm not worried about the refund. You, you gave the money back after 12 months, which is another violation. That's the timeline. 
if we look at the correct timeline, it's actually one month. Because if you go down to line number, um, let's see, number 36, EK was admitted to the hospital on October 13th, 2013. And he never left the hospital. He died on November 2013. And then it goes on over here. It said that there was a request on March 3rd, 2013. The respondent agreed to pay, blah, 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 blah. And then it goes down here and it says respondent completed the refund on or about April 30th, 2014, when that was really 2013. No, no. No. No, in, no, no, no. The the date that the request was March 3rd, 2014. Because March 3rd, 2013 would have been prior to the patient even coming in. Can I right? please interrupt and just ask yeah. that we not relitigate this? Yeah. Okay. Um, so and that so we've established that, that I it, yeah. I'm not getting the sense that there's understanding that through this process and in these documents, respondent is referring to Mr. Hill himself and Mike. Okay. So I, I think we're getting conflicting testimony as per yeah. um, honorable judge Wong's statement. And um, I'm hoping unless there's more that we can more information, we can get as to the rehabilitation here um, that we might move on. Yes. So, so. I, I wasn't talking about the refund of the timeline. I was just talking about the statement where a patient referred to having interactions with respondent. And I don't know who the respondent so was because it wasn't me. I'm not relitigating. I'm just wanting to clarify, but I I I will um, let let that go. I I believe I got my answers. And uh, thank you for indulging me, Ron, for a, a follow-up question. And uh, uh, I have nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further questions from the board? All right, hearing none, um, Mr. Hill, thank you very much for your testimony. You're excused as a witness. Um, Ms. Hedrickson, do you, you do you rest? Me? Hey. Yes, did you talk? I can't hear you. Oh, okay. Oh, you... I wanted to ask him 1 question on redirect if I could your honor. All and right. I just Re excused him. I just uh, wanted to ask him 1 let, question. Let's, let's go ahead and bring him back, but bring him back. But, okay. um, I apologize. Yeah, just make it, make it quick, please. Um, so, uh, Mr. Sure. Hill, I'll remind you that you're still under oath. Yes. Okay. Um, during you mentioned sending in CEs to New York. Did you also have to renew your license? Um, over the last 6 years. I believe so. And during the renewal process, did you have to disclose um, or did you have to submit an application during the renewal process? I think it was just sending in the, the stub with the check. Okay. And did the stub have any kind of questions about whether or not there was any kind of um, out of state uh, actions or discipline on your license with any other state? I don't recall. I uh, know other questions are. All right, thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, um, you're excused as a witness. Um, Ms. Henriksen, do you rest? Yes, Your Honor. All right, um, Mr. Stone, uh, do you wish to give a closing? Uh, no, thank you, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Henriksen, your closing. Sure. All right. Um, so there's a couple of things here that need to be taken into account. And I understand I got a little bit heated here. First of all, I need to apologize because I didn't by any means mean any disrespect. I was only trying to answer questions, so I apologize. Um, Mr. Hill is required to admit to all of the allegations. And I know that that is extraordinarily confusing because on the one hand, we're not here to relitigate. On the one hand, you guys are asking him to go one by one by one, and everyone wants to ask him about each individual allegation. And so how do we now um, say that he is supposed to 
by the nature of his surrender agreement, agree to, or I'm sorry, admit to all the allegations, and yet we're not relitigating, and you guys are asking him about specific allegations. It is a extremely difficult process, and Mr. Hill and I have wrestled with this question, frankly, for weeks now, because he is a, excuse me, my mouth is dry, not just as he under oath today, but he is a person of God, and it was an extraordinarily difficult task for him to think about. And I think that's what you guys just saw. It is what you just saw. Because you're thinking to yourself, why is he dancing around? It's because he's taking that oath extraordinarily seriously. And he, on the one hand, is trying to explain to you guys that he understands that this whole case, what you see here as far as it's what's in front of me, as far as these allegations, are about him being in front of patients and the patients thinking that he's a doctor. He is very well aware of that. But if we're going to go line by line through the accusation, that's where we run into a problem. And we are fully aware of that. Okay. We are fully aware that there are maybe some allegations that he does not necessarily agree with. And that is the problem. Okay. That we have here today. That's what you guys all just witnessed. Okay. But he doesn't have that option because we're not here to relitigate that. And that's not the issue that we're supposed to be here today for. And so he's not perjuring. He doesn't want to perjure himself. He doesn't want to sit here and tell you what on the one hand, he wants to tell you what he's supposed to, which is that he admits to everything. But on the other hand, he doesn't want to lie to you and say, that yes, on paragraph 33, that that's him when he knows it's not him. And that's where he's talking about the perjuring. So that's where we run into issues. And at the end of the day, the issue is whether or not he's going to accept responsibility for those that he hurt and whether or not he's going to accept responsibility for what he did, which is he created a business model where there are patients, there's patient EK and there's patient um st who came into his practice who believed he was the doctor that's the problem and that's what the root of this was is that they believed that he was the doctor and he understands that okay whether or not all this other stuff about you know specifically whether he ordered the medication or not we know he doesn't have a dea license we know that didn't happen but the point is that they believed he was a doctor, and that's the scope of practice issues that were at issue. How can he guarantee it's not going to happen again? Because he's not going to work in a place that has a medical office. Well, isn't it a problem that he's in medical school? I don't know. Is it a problem when a criminal goes to law school after they've been in jail? Are we going to say that that's a problem? Is that how we want to look at this, or do we want to look at people saying, hey, I want to better my life. He's trying to better his life for him, his family, his wife, his kids. He watched his own daughter get arrested from this. He's learned from this situation. He's had his face slapped on the front cover of the newspaper. So I understand it didn't look pretty for a while there. It didn't look pretty for me. I get it. I looked like a jerk and I'm sorry. I'll be real honest. I'm sorry. But I want you guys to seriously look at what this man has done and try to learn from this and try to grow from this. This is not who he is. And as far as New York goes, there's no way he, he might not remember. And I get that. He clearly does not remember. You can't go six years renewing your license without being asked whether or not you had discipline in another state. No one does that. So, of course, he's disclosed it. So, they know all about it. He is not hiding this from anybody. The whole city he lives in knows about it. His whole community knows about it. 
He has no problem telling every patient that walks through the door if he realizes about it. This is, he's not hiding this from anybody. This man is praying in front of God, in front of everybody that he knows and talking to everybody he knows about it. So again, I know it did not look pretty here today and I get that, but I want you guys to understand that he has done everything, everything for the past six years to be here for you guys today. Hoping because we can say, oh my gosh, of course, this is somebody who all he wants to do is he wants to be a doctor and how terrible of him because he had controlled substances and he did this and he had that. No, no. He set out on a mission to help people. And when he says he blurred the lines, what he's saying is that he opened a practice where people came in and they didn't know who was the chiropractors and who was the doctors. And that's what he's learned. He's learned, you know what? No more. That's what the problem was. It's not that doctors were doing things for chiropractors and chiropractors were the, that's not what happened here, you guys. The doctors were on the medical side. The PAs, the NPs, they were on the medical side and the chiros were on the chiro side. But that's not what the patients understood here. And that was the problem. That was the problem. And all this about people injecting themselves, they're supervisors, where were they? But that's not the point, they shouldn't have been doing that. And the supervisors over on the medical side should have been watching that. He's not supervising medical staff. He has no, no authority in any world to be supervising a medical staff person. Let's keep that in mind. There are medical corporations set up for a reason. And this was all under an attorney. So the point that is really at the heart of this, really at the heart, is what the patients thought. That is really what was at the heart of it. Okay, because we can sit here and ask ourselves whether or not this actually occurred. But at the end of the day, this was all submitted to a criminal prosecutor. And at the end of the day, no charges were brought. Okay? Let's remember that. At the heart of this, patients thought he was a doctor and that's what he's talking about with blurred lines. And that's what I, him and I have had long discussions about. It is not okay. And he understands that. He truly does. And so I really wish, rather than relitigating all this, we can look at, okay, what has he been doing since? It's been six years. He shut down the practice. What's going on since then? What has happened for six years? Let's look at the hundreds of hours of continuing education. Let's look at the way he's rebuilt his life. Let's look at the fact that he has begged, that he has worked honest jobs. Let's look at the fact that he has um, continue to do, even though he's the one who is making barely ends meet, who's still spending hundreds of hours in the church, who's still spending hundreds of hour, uh, hours volunteering for, to help others. Because that's actually who this person is. Okay? He is the person who got his license before this board to help people. He's not some crook. He's not some skeezy guy who came up with these testosterone shots and all this junk that like we read in this accusation. He's an honest, hardworking person who believes in education, who believes in bettering himself, and who has done nothing but spent six years getting up at 4.30 every morning to start medical school, working round the clock, he goes, does his work in the brush or sweeping hair at a hair salon to babysitting his daughter's kids to make ends meet so he could be here today. And so I can't tell you how humble this person is. I can't tell you how he's got the whole community 
a Modesto behind him right now. He's got his whole church community behind him. He's patients are safe. And that is the number one priority of the board as to whether or not patients will be safe. And I understand that what we're reading here is not pretty. And I understand that. And I wish the board, we could focus on everything that he has done. And I wish we could focus on his heart and everything that he, his intent. And look at all of the things that have happened, both what he's learned and see that this is somebody who has seriously done everything he can to be here in front of you guys today. He has not held back anything. He has not, again, it wasn't pretty, I get it, but there was no dishonesty here. There was no, this wasn't an attempt to deceive anybody. There was no anything, this was, we just want the board to know the truth. That's it, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Ms. Henriksen. Uh, so that concludes the hearing in this matter. So the uh, record's closed. Uh, the matter's submitted, and we are off the record. Um, and um, Ms. Henriksen, as as you probably heard me uh, say with the other matters. Uh, the board will deliberate in closed session about this matter after it hears um, the other matters, and then um, a decision will be issued uh, later on in the future. So one will not be issued today. Um, and then um, my office will provide yours with a copy of the court, court reporter uh, form uh, probably sometime tomorrow, given that it's starting to get a little late today and, and we still have a couple more hearings. Okay, thank you, so Honor. do you have any questions? No, Your Honor, thank All you. All right, thank you very much. Um, and Madam Court Reporter, when you have a chance, if I could get a page estimate. Uh, the page estimate for this one is 89 pages. Thank you. And Dr. Paris, uh, shall we proceed to the next one or does the board wish a break? Yeah, I think everybody um, would like uh, maybe if we could take 10 minutes. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, uh, board member suite has rejoined us. So just, uh, we, we can retake role when we come back. Very good. Thank you.